Now, guys, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by European tour player, Irishman, Nal Carney. Nal, how you doing? Hi, Johnny. Great to be here. Um, thanks for coming on the podcast, firstly. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, how have you been? Have you had the last few weeks been for you? Yeah, it's been good. Obviously, the season has been busy enough, Johnny, which has been great. And um, I've been home in Dublin now the last two weeks. I just, you know, I haven't gotten into the last couple of tournaments, so it's been a little bit difficult sitting on the sidelines and watching the other guys play and stuff. So but that's that's just the nature of the status that I have. And um, I'll get back out now next week in Holland, which will be good. What do you do then for those two weeks that you're you're off? Did you watch much of the the Solheim Cup? I was still. Uh, I did. I did. I watched a lot of Solheim Cup. Yeah. I watched obviously the FedEx playoffs, which was you know quite exciting as well. And the country was very impressive. Um, I've just been sort of resting as well, Johnny. Uh, you know, we're getting to that time of the season. It's you know it's been busy. Obviously, uh, the last run was was a was a five week run, so I was sort of tired after that anyway. And um, obviously, we're in the sort of card race now as well. So every you know all those tournaments are not not that it's more stressful, but it's just there's a bit more importance on it. And um, so yeah, it's been it's been great to get home, get some rest. I've been doing some work down in the studio, and, um, you know. So this week now, particularly, I'll get back into my own practice, which will be good. Very good. We might go back to the very beginning, if that's all right. And um, for for anyone that might not be as aware, uh, who are you and where have you come from? Um, well, I started playing. I'm 33 now. Um, I started playing golf when I was 12, 10, 12. Um, got started by my dad and uncle really my uncle was actually a really good player him and he was, his lowest handicap was 5 um, dad got down to I think 10 something like that um, both of them loved golf uh, dad's game would have been rugby actually but after his rugby career he then sort of fell into golf which was which was great and, um, so I started just caddying for them really Johnny out in Corstown mainly and um, you know I used to caddy for my uncle in you know, senior cup matches and Junior Cup matches, Barton Cup and all that, and just, just loved it, you know, so I was bitten by the bug early, so I've, I've you know, I've sort of been knee-deep in golf since I was 10 or 12, really. So you followed your uncle and then your brother followed your dad, is that how it worked? My brother followed my dad's rugby, yeah, absolutely, and then uh, dad's obviously mad into his, into his golf now as well, so it's great to have that split within the family too, in terms of, you know, the two different sports and two different areas. So your brother, Mick, obviously currently played rugby for, for Ulster. Growing up in that kind of a sporting household, were were every sport very competitive, or did you kind of you knew earlier on that golf was your game and you want to focus on that? Or yeah, I never really played anything else. I played a little bit of school rugby. I wasn't any good really, and uh, so <laughs> I stuck to golf. Uh, Michael was pretty much rugby all the way too. You know, okay. he, you know, none, you know, neither of us played any GAA or anything like that. So we were, you know, we were sort of destined from the start. We were on the pathway on those uh on those particular spots so you know, just kept going I was, gonna, I was gonna ask who is he who'd be better at the respective sports though would you be better at rugby or would michael be better at uh at golf if you were to oh michael's much better at golf than i would be at rugby <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he plays off at 12 or 13 something like that and he's well able to play yeah that's that's, that's great that's i guess even growing up what's the, what's the age difference between the two of you uh three years so growing up having having like uh someone to bounce off or to play with train with us so that must always be nice yeah it was great it was great yeah we had a great household growing up and you know my sister was sort of she was like the number one fan she was sort of keeping us both grounded and um now michael's a very disciplined guy you know if you, if you sort of watch him go about his training now and his preparation for his games and all that sort of stuff it's, it's very uh it's quite impressive yeah do you take much from that into your own preparation yeah, it's great. You know, we socialise a lot together and coffee together and stuff like that. It's good to actually talk about those things. And, um, yeah, it's good. You know, obviously it's different being in a team environment to being, in, you know, golf is obviously the individual scenario. But, um, you know, it's tough. It's tough being in the team uh, gig as well, as far as I can gather, because it's, you know, like you're trying to get everybody to actually be on the same page, which I'm sure can be can be tricky. You know? And um, so you mentioned that, that your dad and your uncle kind of got you in, into the game when, like, when was that in particular you were say about 10 or 12 10 or 12 yeah so um i used to caddy for them you know they used to play a lot of golf um that name and so um i used to go caddying for them and you know if you're out 
playing or they were out playing, they say, go on, I'll go up on to the next tee and hit a shot and then, you know, we'll be okay or whatever. So that's that's how I, you know, got to actually start hitting the ball, which was which was brilliant, you know, it was great encouragement from them. And um, so, yeah, I sort of went from there. I think my first handicap was 24 down in Forestown. And um, Dad was playing a lot of golf after work in the evenings and stuff like that. So, you know, he used to, he used to have access to, to sort of quite a lot of play, which was, which was invaluable at that time. And um, I think I played my first GUI competition, which was another 15th championship in Beaverstown. I think it was maybe 14 at that time. Okay. That's pretty fast. So wh- when did you realize then that you were like pretty good at golf? Well, I went uh, I think, uh, I can't remember what my handicap was in that championship now when I was 14, but I went out and shot 72 and won it on the day. And so sort of everybody's like, geez, where did that come from? You know, we didn't expect that at all. So, um, <laughs> I suppose that was, that was sort of the start of the journey, really. Um, and so, you know, I suppose I'm, what's that, 19 years now playing with, with sort of card in hand as such and playing, playing sort of competition golf, you know. So uh, that, was, that was very much the start of the journey. How did your youth amateur career then progress from there? Because you went on then, obviously, to compete at the highest level of amateur golf, competing with the likes of Rory and Shane. Um, yeah. What was the journey from that 14-year-old amateur championship onwards? Well, it went from there, and it's just, you know, look, there was the under-15s championships at that time, so I was playing Leinster under-15s, and obviously I won that Leinster when I was 14, so, so I still had another year of those championships to play, which was great, and obviously it was, you know, it was quite a burden on mum and dad as well, because they had to drive me around then, and, um, you know, so it was that sort of scene, and then after that, it was sort of, I got myself into the system as such, I think. I can't quite remember whether there was underage panels back then, but there were there were certainly coaching opportunities. I remember being being part of underage Leinster panels, being up at the airport driving range with Simon Byrne and all those great coaches. And um, so I was I was sort of I was very much getting into the system, which is which is obviously very important because once you're in, you sort of tend to graduate through the whole system all the way through. So um, so yeah, I was lucky in that sense, Johnny. Really. I mean, how tough to, was a decision then to, to turn professional because obviously it's you see the the likes of yeah like Rory Shane and, and the guys kind of turning professional and then flying it but for, mm. for many guys it's not really that dramatic was it something that straight away you knew no like this is like I have to do this it's not a case that I want to do this no it wasn't even that I just I felt so I did a I did a short stint over in uh, over in college over in um, ETSU, didn't really like it, and um, I was I was a decent amateur at that stage, um, and I always felt as though I'd like to give the pro game a good, you know, a good crack, and um, so I came back from the states. This is around two thousand and eight now. Um, came back and won the South of Ireland in two thousand and eight. Uh, I made the Walker Cup panel at that time. And then 2009, I went on to win the Brabazon Trophy, which was the English amateur. And then I went on to make the Walker Cup team. And, and so I you know, sort of felt that was the end of the road then in terms of the amateur game for me. I felt as though it really, not that I had to go on, but I just felt the time was right then to let's, let's go and give it a good go now and see where it goes. Why didn't you like college? Just didn't really take to it. I think I was a little bit homesick. Um, you know, the, there was absolutely magnificent facilities, the best you could, you know, you know, you'd ever hope for it. It was great competition and stuff like that. But it just, just, just felt as though it wasn't the right fit for me at the time. That's interesting. So we had Gavin Moynan on the podcast as well, and he mentioned something similar about being kind of homesick. The life of a tour golfer, there's not a huge amount of time spent at home. No, there's certainly not. I suppose it's at a different sort of time in your life as well, Johnny. You're, you know, you're younger. You, you know, you've been at home for 18 years at that stage, and so it's. You know, uh, mm. it's a different world. But um, yeah, I just, I just didn't get the right feelings over there. I just, you know, uh, even though the setup was great and there was, there was Irish players there, I went over with Seamus Power, and you know, we shared the same apartment. And Seamus is obviously a great friend, and um, you know, he obviously stayed on and went on, and he's, you know, he's doing brilliantly now. And um, so, so yeah, it's gas. Just you know, two different mindsets. We, you know, just. We just had different feelings on it, really, you know. Seamus has had a fantastic year this year. 
Oh, absolutely off the charts. Yeah, super golf. It's been it's been great to follow him, and obviously we keep in touch. And um, yeah, he's doing he's doing brilliantly well. It's great to see. Do you keep in touch with him much? I don't know. Just the odd text there and there. You know, I'd love to see him. You know, he's going to be home now uh, shortly. I think so. You know, I'd love to catch up with him then. You know, that'd be super. I'm sure you. Uh, I'm sure you gave him a call there after his win. Ah, oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. We had a bit of fun after that. That was great. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned there going back to the amateur amateur game. You went, didn't you? Made Walker Cup. Was that that was something that you had pegged as a target that you wanted to achieve before potentially turning professional? Yeah, it was. Um, when I made the panel in sort of two thousand and eight, mm. I felt as though I'm not I'm not in a sort of a selection position right now. I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to win. I'm going to have to win a couple of times or whatever. And um, I was fortunate. I went on to win the South, obviously. And then I went to the, to the Brabazon, which was which was one of the key events at that time to actually get, get picked on the team. So um, so that, that sort of sealed the deal for me. But uh, I think unless I did something like that, you know, it wasn't going to happen, you know. Sure. Um, so then you did, you did turn professional. I went to tour school as an amateur after Walker Cup. Um, and it was on in Catalonia at that time. Obviously, there was there was first stage and second stage as well. Mm. But um, I went straight to tour school and played. Dad was sort of like, "Look, let's just go and see. Play as an amateur. There's nothing to lose. Let's just see where we're at." And um, so I went, and I think I missed the card by three or four shots. Uh, made the cut, missed the card, and so obviously, in missing the main tour card, I got a full challenge tour card, obviously. Uh, and I, I had sort of limited my intro starts as well at that time. So I said, right, now's the time. You know, I've got a great schedule now for next year. Let's just turn pro. So, so that's what we did. And what was that first first season like? What's what's challenge tour like? Because like we had, spoke to Eric Van Roy and who said that some events are great, but some of them are are pretty pretty far from great. Yeah, yeah. So this is back now in two thousand and this will be the two thousand and ten season. And yeah, the first season was was okay. If I was being honest, I wasn't ready for it, Joey. You know, my game wasn't at the right level at that stage. Okay. Um, so you know, even though I played played okay, I made some cuts and all that all that sort of stuff, I wasn't at it. You know, I wasn't at the races at that time. And um, so I sort of, you know, I sort of did that for. I played the twenty ten season. I, managed to hold on to some sort of status and so went back to tour school again and got more status out of that. So tour school has actually been good to me over the last 10, 12 years. Uh, I've always seemed to do well. I've always gotten some sort of status out of it, which is, which has been positive, you know? Um, but like those, those early years when I, when I had a challenge tour card, looking back now, obviously it's easy to look back now, but you know, I just, I just wasn't not, not necessarily ready for it, but I just, I wasn't, good enough to actually compete to win a challenge tour tournament at that time. What's the difference then? So you've obviously played at the highest level of the amateur game and then there's only really one place for you to go from from that. What's mm. the difference then between the highest level of the amateur game and, and competing professionally? Yeah, I think, like, it's obviously I've been out of the amateur game so long now, so, you know, it's hard for me to comment on it, but it's, it's I think... I think the gap is possibly getting a little bit wider. Um, I just think, you know, if you if you look at the average scoring now in Challenge Tour, it's 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 low, 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 low. I mean, it just you you, you know you can you can hardly afford shoot level power anymore, you know. And so that's that's the way it's gone. Obviously, I know when I was back amateur and we were we were playing links golf and we were you know there was quite a bit of match play. There was also stroke play, but it was you know it was it was tough to shoot five six under par because you're on a, a Links course that's set up difficult. The weather is generally indifferent, and so it sort of got you into the zone of shooting seventy one, seventy two, and that that being a good score. And um, and then obviously you're you're sort of plopped into the middle of Europe somewhere. Somewhere the weather is perfect, the course is you know softer and all the rest. And you know you've got to go out and shoot sixty four and sixty five, and so it's you know it's different. It's just different. It takes time to actually adjust to that. And how long do you think it took you to make that adjustment? I think it took me a while. You know, I've always been been sort of slow in that sense. And, um, you know, like I always felt as though I've been somebody that has to lose 10 times before they win. You know, I've got to, I've got to suffer 10 times and then, then I'll actually break through and get a, you know, get a win or whatever. But um, 
in terms of my of my sort of early years, I was I was sort of I felt as though I was playing okay, but again, I didn't feel as though I could win a tournament. And um, so, like I said, I played I played challenger I think for four years. I then went and played the Asian tour for for a season. Um, mm. I just I just felt you know at that time I needed just different scenery. I needed to see different faces. I wanted to play different courses. Having had three or four years of going back to the same courses, looking at the same guys, all that sort of stuff. And um, I had been going to Asian Tour Q School anyway each year. I think I did Asian Tour Q School 10 years in a row, maybe something like that. So that that was on every January. And uh, I broke through that and I think it was 2014, I got a, I got a full car on the Asian Tour. So I suppose... I had to sacrifice my challenge tour status at that time to go and play in Asia. Um, and so, you know, I was taking, you know, I was taking the risk doing that, but I just, like I say, I fancied doing it. I fancied being somewhere different, living somewhere different. Um, and so that's, that's where I was the season of 2014 and half of 2015, which was great. So when you, that's really interesting. So the, the 10 years of doing Asian tour Q school was that, just have a an another potential route to getting where you wanted to get to, or was that for practice, or or wh- why do ten years of Asian tour school if you're not going to play? I was I was I was wintering out there anyway. Great. And so Asian tour school was generally around Christmas time, January that that sort of time. So I sort of looked at it as a great time to play competitive golf. Sure. Based on the fact there's no competitive golf happening anywhere else at that time, um, so that was that was obviously number one. And then obviously I wanted to get a card out there because you know it just you know it's a great part of the world, Southeast Asia, and I loved I loved the idea of maybe playing a bit of a schedule out there. Um, and so I think I think actually in 2014 when I did have the card, because the Asian Tour plays mainly in sort of the winter months, so I play from sort of January to April, and then it picks it up again around September. So. I think I played Asian Tour during the winter months, and then I, I sort of utilised my Challenge Tour card during the during the summer months, um, which was great. And uh, but obviously I didn't play enough Challenge Tour, so essentially I was sacrificing Challenge Tour card. But I, you know, I still I still felt as though it was going to be worth it. Yeah. Um, that's really that's that's really really interesting that you went down the route. John Catlin, um, did the same thing. He said he went down. Yeah. Coming from the states, he went through through Asia. Yeah. Um, yeah. w- is that a route that you'd suggest to a couple of Irish pros looking to 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 make it in the European Tour or Challenge Tour or go yeah, over winter it, in Asia? Know, I think it is a genuine route, Johnny. Yeah, you know, I think it always has been. You know, and I, you know, when I was thinking of going, this is that's that's going way back to when I was first going out there. I was sort of speaking to Gary Murphy and guys like that, and Gary went down that route as well. Where you know he went to Asia, got a car, played out there. And, you know, it's a great experience out there. It's a great part of the world. Uh, the golf is slightly different, obviously, the different grasses and the temperatures can be extreme. Yeah. But um. But but yeah, you know, like when I was going out there for ten years, I think, I think I was. There might have been Niall Turner was was out there as well at that time, but there was. I think I could have been the only Irish guy that was actually competing in tour school out there for those ten years, which was. You know, it was it was actually a little bit surprising, you know, based on the fact that there are great opportunities out there. Yeah, it's it's a how big of an investment is it in comparison to trying to go through like Euro Pro or or Alps or Challenge Tour? Is it it must be to, to get out there pr- pretty costly? Yeah, in terms of just to play the tour school. Uh yeah, and then even to to do your year out there. Even this, yeah, to stay out there. Yeah, look, it's you, you know, it's hard to put a figure on it. I think. I think the entry into tour school was maybe two thousand dollars, something like that. And then obviously the flights at that time of year, because it's high season out there, the flights are very expensive at that time. Uh, and then obviously put yourself up, and there's a couple of different stages. Yeah, you know, and I suppose coming off the back of European tour school, which is only on a couple of months prior, it can it can turn into quite a quite a chunky investment over that period of time if you're going to do both, you know. So then, how was Asian tour? It was also successful for you. Yeah, I played for um, it's gas the Asian Tour at that time. Even though I had a full card, I think I only played ten events, something like that, um, which was obviously disappointing. Um, it just didn't seem to be the opportunities on that 
on that year that I actually had a car. Um, but I, you know, played in some great places. We were in China, we were in Singapore. I remember being in the Philippines. Actually, I had one of my best weeks out there in the Philippines, and uh, it was roast. It was forty degrees, absolutely roasting. And um, final day, Sunday was going okay. Sunday was going okay for me, and uh, I said, "Right, this is going to be a good week." You know, jump up the order there and all the rest. And uh, Eagle the eighteen, the eighteen was par five. Eagle the eighteen came in the scorer, so the scorer wasn't there. The scorer was on lunch, so there was a, there was a sort of a guard there taking the taking the cards and whatever. Nobody's really checking them, whatever. So signed the card in from up in the sort of lounge, having uh, having lunch, and the TV screen is there with the leaderboard and stuff like that. You know, Niall Carney tied age 69 or something. I said, geez, no, I shot a 70. And so ran back down to the score so to make sure the card said 70 and not 69, hoping that it was just some you know, some sort of error in terms of the leaderboard. But, uh, but no, I signed for 69, even though I shot a 70. So it was DQ'd. So <laughs> that, was, that was a difficult time. But, um, but yeah, things like that that sort of happened to you along the way. And uh, you, know, you sort of look back and say, Jesus, that was, that was just, you know, it was, it was just a sick time, you know. But, um, lessons learned. So. Yeah. On the Asian tour then, I think it's fascinating. We just, like you said, we don't really hear enough of Irish guys coming out there and playing it. Um, where where stood out to you as somewhere that you'd just even love to go back to? Where was one tour stop that you absolutely loved to play? I'm sure the Philippines has some kind of a sour taste now after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, we, there were some great destinations out there, Johnny. Like we went to, we were in Singapore. That was a fabulous city and great golf course. And um, we played a couple of tournaments around Thailand. Thailand's a great country. You know, the people are great and the food is the food is great. And um, it's just it's just a great part of the world in general. You know, I, I sort of based myself in Thailand because Bangkok is such a great airport. And sort of flow. Uh, you know, a single flight will sort of get you to, to any of the Asian tour destinations, which was great. But um, but no, it's definitely it's de- you know it's definitely a place to go for any young pros that are that are looking for something different and also good opportunities. You know. So then, how did you? When did you come back then to Challenge Tour and eventually on to Europe? Came back, so didn't keep a card out there. It was only top sixty in the order. Where I kept cards out there. Okay, uh, out of how many? Time. Ah, out of, you know, there could have been 200 guys on the order mayor, 250 guys in the order mayor. Okay. So, um, so yeah, it was tough. And obviously coming out of tour skills, well, it's like coming out of any tour skills, you don't get the big events. So the, so the top 60 guys from the previous year are playing all the sort of co-sanctioned events from, you know, European tour and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, you know, coming out of tour skills, you really have to win out there in order to, to sort of break into that top 60. How does the Asian tour scoring actually compare then to what you were saying about Challenge Tour, where you went from the amateur circuit where 70, 71, even par was, was a good score to Challenge Tour, you got to be shooting mid 60s. Is it was the Asian Tour the same story? You got to be in the mid 60s to be kind of the Asian Tour is similar, albeit different. Um, because you're sort of pitched up with a couple of guys that have you know, homemade swings, and you're saying, geez, how are these guys going to get around the golf course? And suddenly they're signing for 66, and you're signing for 73. You know, <laughs> so you sort of say, what's going on here? But, um, but yeah, no, the guys, the guys can play out there. They're very, very impressive. And, um, you know, I learned a lot out there in terms of the short game. And, you know, the guys are they're just deadly out of the different grasses and stuff like that. And, like I say, a lot of their swings are sort of, you know, homemade, and they've they've got sort of intri- you know intricacies in terms of what they do, but um, but very impressive to watch them get around the golf course. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So then you didn't hold on to your tour card, came back to Europe, challenge tour. What was the the next step after Asian tour? Yeah, well, I came back, and um, I think I actually played because I sacrificed the challenge tour card going out to Asia and now suddenly I've lost the Asian tour card as well. Now I'm sort of in limbo a little bit. So I think I played the Euro Pro Tour then. Um, now I'm sort of probably, I'd be in my mid-twenties now, but still loving the game, loving the journey, albeit it's been difficult enough. Um, and so I'm sort of saying, okay, well, where am I going to play now? Because I have to play, you know, competition golf. I can't just practice around and wait for tour school to come around again. 
So um, so yeah, I think I think I went to play Euro Pro for a couple of years, um, which was great. You know, it's you know it's tough out there. The courses the courses are good, bad, and different. And um, obviously the competition is fierce. They've they've got full fields. It's you know you, it's basically sort of a major sweep. You know you pay in and play for the money. And um, and so that was that was where I played. You know, and I played there for a couple of years until I. Till I got back to tour school and got some status back, you know. How tough is it on the Euro Pro? We spoke to a few guys that are playing on the circuit at the moment as well. Where, yeah, it's everyone's kind of got the same goal. Where Euro Pro is a stepping stone to to something bigger. Um, how how different is that scenario after Asian Tour and before that challenge? Yeah, it's different. You know. Um, I suppose mentally it feels like you're stepping down, um, but at the same time you you know just have to accept that this is this is card in hand golf. It's going to keep me sharp. I'm playing against really good players. Um, like I was traveling with Johnny Caldwell around the Euro Pro Tour for those couple of years. You know it's gas. You know Johnny's Johnny's gone on to win the European Tour. You know so you just I think you just have to accept where you are. You have to grind it out. You have to say look this is. This is again a good opportunity for me to try and learn how to win, and um, you know. So I think I think based on based on the company that I was in, I was able to do that a little bit easier. You know. You um your journey similar enough to to Johnny's. His recent win must have given you a did it give you a renewed sense of um fire? I guess that you can yeah of course do this. Of course. You know, I think it gave all of all us Irish pros you know a great boost and. Um, Johnny's a fabulous player. He's a great guy, and uh, you know, I've seen how hard he's worked over over the ten or twelve years, and um, it's great to see it culminating and actually getting a win. You know, so so it's obviously you know he's going to have a super schedule now over the next couple of years, and hopefully he can he can push on to bigger things. You know, what does that do for you personally? You see your good friend going on getting a win. Do you come home for these two weeks that you're off and go? All right, like that's always been the goal but we got to push on or are you you're comfortable with where you're at in, in your game and and physically and everything yeah i don't think you're ever comfortable where you're at i think you're always trying to get better you're always trying to push it on and um, you know i've had some some sort of times this year where i felt as though i could you know i could really push on and um i was in germany a few weeks ago i was leading after this after the second round and you know that was after Johnny's win, so that was that was obviously sort of burrowing away somewhere in the back of my mind. Well, actually, you know, this this is possible, like you know. So, um, so I mean, that's what that's what that sort of scenario does for you. Watching Johnny do that, that's that's suddenly implanted in your in your psyche, and you know, suddenly you go out there and you start playing well. You know, yeah. Um. So then we doing a couple of years on on Euro Pro. You went back to Q Q school. Yeah. Yeah, I was going back to Q school every year. You know, I think I've done European Q school every year since I've turned pro. Um, so that's that's probably 10, 10 visits anyway. And then 10 visits over now, so so I sort of, you know, I trust you the old veteran, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I went back in 20, uh, obviously 2019, it hasn't been tour school the last couple of years. I went back yeah. in 2019 and... Um, I went all the way again, first stage all the way through the final stage. Uh, missed the card, I think, by three shots in the end. Two shots, three shots, something like that. It was tight enough anyway. You know, I had an opportunity to get it. And um, so, again, I found myself in that in that sort of scenario where I've got a full challenge tour card, but uh, I've also got a sort of a low category in terms of European tour as well. So um, I was going to get some starts, and then obviously COVID has hit. And so I've I've managed to get much more stars than I anticipated based on COVID. So um so yeah. How has the last I guess it's what two seasons now probably at this point have that been with the COVID situation? No fans. It's, it's a weird it's a, a weird dynamic to play. Yeah, it is. But I'm just grateful to get the opportunities, Johnny. You know, COVID has obviously been a you know massively difficult time and all the rest. But from a from a golfing point of view, for me, it's been helpful. Because I've got category twenty two on the um, on the main tour, which would normally get maybe five tournaments a year, and um, I'm probably going to play fifteen tournaments this year. So that's that's the sort of effect COVID has had 
as in guys that are that are in far flung places around the world, they can't actually get to tournaments. And so hence why I will I will then get access, you know. So um so it's been positive. Obviously, you know, the the fans and the sort of infrastructure and all that sort of things, it's not it's not really on my radar. I'm just grateful to be there and grateful to have the opportunities. And this year has been great because I've you know I've managed to actually make make use of those opportunities. And um, you know, so going into next season now I'll actually, you know, I'll have I'll have strong status either way, you know. Yeah, I think um, like the f- likes of the fans is obviously Pete, they, they weren't there for a while and the infrastructure, mm. but those are things that'll always they'll always come back. They they, they just naturally will. Um, mm. But this summer saw some really really positive results for yourself. So I think you're saying there that you've you've had twelve starts now this season. Yeah. Um, must be really really positive. Some some great results there. You mentioned Germany, but even in, from starting with Gran Canaria with the um, T21. Mm. That kind of set off in motion a couple of months of some some good results. A couple of missed cuts in there as well, but some very very good results. How how positive yeah. were you feeling going into Grand Canaria? Were you on a holiday or something before? When you I got was, the yeah, was and Dad went down. We were obviously suffering through uh, lockdown here, a bit like everybody else. You know, it was a difficult time, and um, I was fortunate. I had my had my sort of indoor swing studio, which was great. So I was I was practicing seven eight hours a day, which was you know I was blessed. You know, I was blessed to have that, and um, nice facility to have at your disposal. Yeah, it was super, and um, so um, things opened up a little bit, and I was I was actually going to practice for the the challenger events that were going to be on down in South Africa. So I said, right, I'm going to go down to Spain, practice for five or six days. I've got a, you know I have a great friend Brendan O'Malley, who's got membership in Las Brisas. Brendan was down there at the time, and um, so Dad said, right, let's let's go to Spain, five or six days, you'll get five or six games of golf. Obviously, the courses were closed there at that time, Johnny. So it was actually just to try and get a few games of golf. You know, it's fine, it's fine hitting balls and all the rest and practicing, but to, to actually take it off the course. So um, that was the whole idea there. And then when we were down there, uh, the swing was starting um, down, in, down in Tenerife, Canaries, that, that uh, swing. So... It's only when we were down there, the second last day we were there, I said, Jesus, the entry list is falling rapidly here for uh, Lopesan Open, which was which was on down in the Canaries. And um, so I think it was 10th or 12th reserve at this stage. I said, Jesus, you know, we might actually get in here. And um, so, you know, it just, it just kept plummeting down and plummeting down. And suddenly we found ourselves in the field. So we said, right. So we, so we flew down from Malaga down to, down to the Canaries. And that's, that's when that sort of swing took off, which was great. Because your dad caddies for you or caddied for you fairly regularly. So was he on the bag then for that swing? He was on for that swing because he was out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course. You know, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the plan. Yeah. But um but no, it worked out great, you know, we got on great and things things have been brilliant, you know. So obviously we went down there, we played well. Um, uh, you know, we three three kind of, you know, solid weeks. Obviously the third week was was good to finish. Uh, you know, finish with uh, sixty one, which was which was positive, mm-hmm. and uh, um, and so so then after that three weeks, we're sort of saying, well, do we do we keep going down the European Tour uh, tournaments now, or do we do we play a bit of Challenge Tour, a bit of European Tour? And this is always the issue with guys that have dual status, whereby how do you how do you balance it out? Where do you where do you concentrate your time? Um, and so after those three weeks, we you know we sort of quite a quite a positive position in terms of the uh, of the race to be advised. We said, well let's let's try and take all our opportunities and on sort of main European tour events and focus focus our efforts on that. And um, so so it turned out this year I didn't play any challenge tour events mm. because it was sort of okay, let's 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 try and play main tour events. When we're not playing a main tour event we're practicing, resting, getting getting ready for the for the following events coming up. So so yeah. So what's the risk of decide not to play any challenge tour events and go for the European tour is there potential that neither come good essentially and obviously you haven't played any challenge tour so you lose status there but then you also yeah. don't earn status on the European tour yeah uh, so basically um, this has gone back earlier in the year now prior to mm-hmm. any safety net system being put in place and so yeah it was sort of let's let's play main European tour until the end of July assess where I am and then um I can I can play challenge tour day in August all the way to the to the finish if that's you know if things are not going well in terms of main tour but things were going well and then 
you know, subsequently they actually came in to say that this, you know, it's going to be a safety net system regardless. And so therefore it's going to be no choice school. Everybody that, that has status this year is going to have some sort of status next year. So that, that, you know, not that it was going to be an issue because what we did down in Spain almost, you know, was going to give us a full challenge to our academy anyway next year. So, um, so yeah, it's all those sort of permutations that you have to try and figure out you know, in terms of order of merits, categories, where you're going to fit in next year, where you have to finish, all that sort of stuff. So for you, it's a case of trying to just improve on your situation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. So, um, so yeah, you know, in terms of in terms of race to Dubai now, obviously it's difficult sitting here talking to you when guys are over for practicing and getting, you know, getting ready to play. And guys yeah. will obviously have the opportunity to pass me out again in terms of race to Dubai. So, um, so yeah, it's trying to, I suppose sitting right now, I'm trying to trying to figure out how many more starts I'm going to get. Uh, this tour, obviously, the schedule is still a little bit volatile. The tournament's been taken out, the tournament's been put in. Uh, you know, COVID is obviously still still having a major say. You know, so um, I think there's maybe seven or eight tournaments left in terms of the schedule, and I think I'd be I'd be looking to maybe get two or two or three of them. So, and you know, I've just got to make the most of those opportunities. So then, go back to to Germany. There, you mentioned earlier. You did have a, have a really really strong finish there or strong strong week there. Um, yeah. I read in your player's diary on the European Tour Ooh. site that um, mm. the final round was a funny one because you're obviously you want to go in there and you want to contend to to win. Obviously having the fifty four hole fifty four thirty six hole lead. Thirty six, yeah. Thirty six hole lead. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to end up in like tied for fortieth or something like that how yeah. is that situation for you and obviously you're you're playing to 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 win but also trying to play to potentially protect yourself as well yeah yeah it's yeah it's tricky enough um i think even though i was leading going out after 36 i think i've shot level power one under on saturday which put me down to type four so i'm still sort of there thereabouts yeah um going out on sunday and um Course was course was strong enough, and there was there was a couple of drivable par fours, you know, especially in the on the sort of back nine that is sort of you know in, you know that sort of situation that you're that you're talking about in terms of do you, do you go for it and risk taking double bogey or do you lay it up give yourself a birdie foot but par par at worst sort of thing. So that that did come into it to an extent, um, and so you know I think I finished twelfth in the end. Um, well, yeah, you've got to sort of weigh up, you know, the strategy, where you're at. Um, and, you know, would I have taken 12 place going into the week? I probably would have, but could I have given myself an opportunity to win if I was, you know, a bit more aggressive? You know, it's very hard to say. Yeah. And then you followed that result up with the Hero Open, tied for eighth there as well. So a good good swing over those couple of, over those couple of events. Yeah. Um, how were you at the the Hero Open? Was it a similar situation, or was was that one where you were going for it a bit more? No, it was different there because uh, we were towards the bottom of the field after after thirty six. I think I did sixty six, sixty six weekend, which was which was great. So I didn't I didn't really have much to lose in terms of the weekend there. You know, I was at the bottom. The only way was up. So um, so yeah, that was actually a positive positive weekend and um, gave us obviously a few more points and all the rest. So just to sort of keep climbing. And is that a kind of position you would prefer to be in? So actually, those are two interesting comparisons where yeah. you are up at the top going into the weekend where, yeah, you can you can contend to win for sure, but maybe also protect where you're at versus coming from behind. Like, Which would you feel more comfortable in? Yeah, I think... I think... Um, I think the hero open and shooting, shooting a couple of decent rounds and you know on Saturday and Sunday I think it's it's easier doing that and it's less stressful I think when you're when you're at the sort of top end going into Saturday and Sunday it's you know it's a bit more pressure a bit more stressful it's a bit more time as well because obviously it's afternoon tea times if you're you know if you're in the top five going on Saturday morning you're, you know, you're teeing off late it's more time to kill so it's a different strategy you know how do you deal with the weight um the weight can be can be tricky you know <laughs> You know, it's sort of an early riser anyway. I wake up, you know, seven o'clock, half seven, and um, you know, so trying to trying to stay in bed longer than that can actually leave you feeling a little bit sluggish. 
So, um, so yeah, you know, you, you're just trying to kill time, you know. And oftentimes, when you're, you know, when you're on the road and playing tournament golf and you're, you're dealing with late tee times, it can be, you know, it can be sort of difficult and party. You feel as though, geez, this is I'm just trying to kill time here, which can be a terrible place to to sort of be as well. You know. Yeah, you like the last thing you want to do is play the round of golf in your head and have completed the eighteen holes before you even set out on the first tee. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, at, like from a from a mental point of view, you know, I'm quite I'm quite calm. Like you know, I'm not I don't uh, don't get too sort of riled up about it. And, um, yeah, you know, it's more so just sort of energy trying to trying to keep the energy up. Obviously, you know, personally, if I if I lie on the bed and read a book for an hour, I feel I feel tired after that. Um, you know, if I was to sit there and watch a series, say for instance, I feel you know I feel tired after that as well. So. You know, better off just going and going and having a walk or going uh, sitting somewhere and having a having a coffee or something like that. So, um, so yeah, I suppose you learn all these things as as you go through and trial and error. How you how you feel having done certain things that morning. Yeah, yeah, it, these all come with experience. Like you said, you've been doing this for what ten plus years now, so experience is standing yeah. to you. Mm, yeah, totally, totally. So you mentioned there earlier on, uh, you've got your swing studio. Mm. When did you when did you set that up, and and what was the, the thought process behind that? Was that to set up as a potential teaching down the line, getting into coaching in the future, or was that purely for selfish reasons so that you can have somewhere to practice during lockdown? Yeah, it was more so selfish reasons, so that I could practice. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was, it was, and um, so I set it up and. Um, Actually, set up a sort of a temporary bay first, uh, sort of a makeshift sort of box off an area of a warehouse, you know, uh, you know, like it wasn't it wasn't overly pretty, but it was it was functional. I bought a launch monitor as well around that time, and that was that was part of the reason why I set it up as well. I bought a bought a uh, Forsyth GC Quad, which is fabulous launch monitor, it's brilliant, and sort of part of its capability, or probably half of its capability, is actually indoors. You know, so I felt as though well. You know, I'm not utilizing this launch monitor to its full extent unless I've got an indoor area where I've got a controlled lab whereby I can work on my game, I can work on the data, work on, on my sort of yardages and stuff like that. And um, so that was that was part of the reason why I did it too. And then, you know, I then you know subsequently moved into a different uh, unit and I've set up two bays and you know just you know put a totally different spec on it. So it's you know it's a really nice environment now to be practicing and. Obviously, I've got I've got guys coming now for coaching and lessons and all that as well, which is which is great for me. It's a great time for me to be able to switch off. And so, great. and so, is coaching something that you'll look at down the line, or is that something that you have the facilities there, mates, yeah. or friends are coming in more so than clients? It's something that I enjoy, um, and even you know during this playing season, you know, I quite. I quite enjoy coming home and doing doing a couple of days teaching and stuff like that because it just it gives me a chance to think about somebody else's golf and take my own head off my golf and what's what's going on and stuff like that. So um so yeah, I have to say I've really enjoyed it. It's energized me. Um it's busy, lots of guys looking to looking to come and stuff like that. Very, very busy. Um but again it's a really nice environment. It's you know, specked out, a couple of G C quads there. Um, you know, have a really nice workshop, which is great. And, um, yeah, I've always been a sort of a tinkerer. You know, I'm, you know, I was listening back to one of your podcasts with David Darcy, and uh, it's just you know, I was listening to him talk about tinkering with, with with clubs and adding weight, taking weight off, and extensions and cutting things down. I've been like that for years and years, fifteen years. You know, so it's it's great to sort of have my own space you know i used to i used to have a little workshop here at home in the box room where it's had you know had my voice and a couple of bits and i'd constantly be paring away at things and trying to make things a little bit better so yeah it's you know it's a real area of interest for me you know very good so what are you currently tinkering with oh constantly tinkering oh the workshop's full of stuff you know i'd be changing grip i'd be adding uh adding swing weight i'd be you know, uh, I could be pulling the shaft out, tipping it, making it a little bit stiffer, see how it plays, getting the data, you know. So I suppose it's great, you know, in terms of the, of the setup that I've got now, I can change stuff up in the workshop, bring it down into the bay and get the data on it straight away. So it's, it's almost like instant feedback. This is, mm. this is better or this is, this is not better, you know. So, um, so it's great. But, like, I would have spent a lot of my childhood in, you know, Mick Murphy shed, you know, a lot of, 
a lot of the listeners might might uh, recognise Mick Murphy's name. He was Mick was obviously a great player himself. And I was I was playing down in Royal Dublin, obviously, and Mick Mick had a great workshop in his in his shed, which was in Clontarf. So uh, I used to spend a lot of days sitting watching Mick doing doing his work, and he was he was brilliant craftsman in terms of fixing clubs and changing things around and guys would come in with a set that would be rusted and all the rest and they could make them look brand new and so that's that's what sparked my interest you know it's only when I, you know if I sit here and look back and, and think back to those days it was my my interest and my sort of curiosity was sparked by McMurphy sitting in his in his shed I think all those years you know it's always nice to have someone like that to spark an interest that you'll take down the line with you yeah fabulous Fabulous, it really was. It was great times, you know. So how you got this week off then while well, Wentworth is going on, and then are you back out on tour after that? Back out next week, yeah, in Holland. So I fly Definitely. out Monday morning. Yeah. So um so yeah, that'll be good to get back out and um get some more points hopefully and try and try and consolidate where I am in terms of the race to Dubai, you know, which will which will be good. And then um after that it's very hard to know, Johnny, because it's obviously this there are tournaments on. It's just it's just a question of whether I'll get in or not. So, sure. um, so yeah, it's sort of it's sort of wait and see, really. So, what are you doing then in between now and Monday? Are you getting it to play much golf, or is it just yeah practice the there? Yeah, yeah, practice last week. I was sort of doing a bit of teaching and stuff last week, and resting, and I was doing some training with Moss as well. And um, so, yeah, this week now I was getting back into the, you know, back into uh, golf stuff and um, plenty of balls and. You know, I'll probably play twice now between now and Sunday. And, um, just, yeah, I'll put in seven, eight hours a day. Yeah, just getting getting sort of tuned in again. Having been off for sort of the last couple of weeks, you sort of feel yourself not dipping, but you just feel a sort of sharpness has just gone a little bit. So just, we just need to find that again, you know. Sure. You mentioned there that you're, you're training with Moss Landman. How mm. tough is it to, to keep up the, the physical and the physio side of things when you're out on tour is always nice to come back check in with him and, and work on a few bits or yeah it is you... it is it's difficult to do it when you're on the road I have to say and COVID's made it a bit more difficult too uh, because sometimes you don't have access to any gyms when you're out there so you're sort of confined to your hotel room and you know you're sort of working with fans and spiky balls and stuff like that trying to create some sort of workout and um, so yeah it's difficult and I find when I'm out playing tournament golf as well and you know I tend to I tend to lose weight during sort of tournament weeks. You know, I might, might lose a kilo, a kilo and a half. So over over a four or five week period, you suddenly find yourself you you sort of dip quite a bit. Wow. So um, so yeah, I've constantly got to sort of try and stay on top of all that stuff. Moss has been great, um, fabulous guy. Really knows the stuff. Made a massive difference to my uh, game, to my posture, to my sort of power and speed. And um, so yeah, like there was. Over the last couple of winters now, we've done really good strength blocks and speed blocks. And then it's just a case of trying to maintain that during the actual tournament period. And, um, and yeah, so obviously we're coming towards the end of the season now. I feel as though last winter's work has been done away with, you know, sort of starting to feel a little bit weak again, you know, a little bit tired. So looking forward to getting back into that sort of winter block of getting getting some, you know, some sort of structure on it again. Brilliant. Well... We might leave it there if that's all right. Good luck in Holland. Um, we will definitely be rooting for you. But in the meantime, hopefully we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks for having me on. On the tee, Jack Nicholas. This is the minute the millions around the world have waited for. We will allow you to enjoy all of this. They are dancing in the pubs of Dublin. Harrington with an ace. And we have a shining star at sunset. Rory continues his run to greatness. The return to glory.